Somewhere, caught between parallel dimensions, is the containment breach to end all containment breaches. Countless unnumbered and nameless anomalies on a warpath to destroy what has become of a now unrepentantly evil foundation. A testing site rendered distorted and unstable under the power of countless reality warping objects. And me, caught in the middle of it. You're probably wondering how I got here. Well, for starters, I'm what's known as an anomaly. If I can see something, I can crush it using my brain. I guess you'd say I'd have a form of telekinesis, but fine control or remote levitation are not my forte. I'm not sure who I was before the GOC apprehended and brought me here to this strange place. A place ruled by a cruel man named Elliot Emerson and the even crueler foundation that he directed. A place called Site 13. And as for the rest of us contained here, we don't get numbers. The only name I have is the one I gave myself. If I am destined to be trapped in this infernal place by a man named Emerson, I may as well self-identify as his equal and opposite. You can call me Thoreau. And this is the story how I managed to survive 100 days in Site 13. Well, after everything went haywire. <sighs> Here goes nothing. Day 1. Like I said before, this all began with the containment breach to end all containment breaches. It is chaos in the hallways, with anomalies running rampant everywhere. Most are taking revenge on the guards and researchers, but not every one of the unnumbered is in solidarity. The crystal butterflies and the mimetic scribe are indiscriminately going after anything that isn't them, including each other. As for me, I'm wearing a specialized helmet that keeps me blindfolded. It's a power suppressant, since my anomalous ability only works on things I can see clearly. I'd love to remove it, but there's no way to find out which guard has clearance to deactivate my headgear when things are this manic. As much as I'd love to celebrate the reckoning of Site 13, I decided it was better to stay inside my cell for the day. Let the record show that if the Foundation or the GOC do crack down on this, I was well behaved during the breach. Day 2. It's gotten marginally quieter out there. I don't think the fighting has stopped as much as it has moved out of the halls where I've been contained. The Foundation hasn't dropped off any more rations today, so I start to think that maybe this really was the big one. What if everyone somehow got out? I started to wonder about some of my fellow anomalous humanoids and if the containment breach had given them a chance. I don't really know what they look like, because most of the time I am forced to wear a blindfold to suppress my powers, but I have been able to pick up a few hints through listening. There's a clown named Bobble. He was already here when I arrived. And no, he's not a guy dressed as a clown, but like a genuine, actual clown. He's nice enough, but I get the impression he'd be a bad influence on kids. If there were any here. Other than Elijah, of course. He's known as the Leech Boy since he can drain the blood from people with his hands. Ugh, scary stuff, really. I don't dislike either of them, but I'd rather not take my chances running into them during a containment breach. I guess I'll wait out this one a bit longer. I had water from the containment unit sink if I needed to satiate my thirst, and a day without a meal wasn't exactly something new. Day 3. I felt a strange rumbling in the air this morning. Like everything in the entire universe was picked up and dropped back down somewhere else. I don't know how else to describe it. I once heard some of the guards talking about a reality-bending machine called the Thresher on the lower levels. Could it be the work of that thing? Day 4. My old friend Bobble the Clown actually came through for me. He has taken up residence in the digital interface of my cell and is giving me details of what is happening out there. The funniest thing about this clown is that he lives inside of electronic devices. Bobble was never threatened by my abilities because they only work on the physical world. The most I could do to him is crush a television set where he was dwelling. Our friendship is based on the fact that the two of us are among the only things in Site 13 that couldn't cause harm to each other. And sadly, I think that my list of enemies is much higher than Bobble's, and a lot of the things out there might hold a grudge. The reason I haven't been thrown into the fire is that my matter compression ability is useful to the Foundation. I'm not proud to admit it, but I've agreed multiple times to use my abilities to bring some of my fellow anomalies, particularly the larger ones, down to a manageable size for disposal. My reward for this is that I'm not subject to some of the more deadly experiments here, though it's not like these evil, unethical scientists can resist some light torture. Did I mention how much these people hate anomalies? Because make no mistake, 
they hate us a lot. Bobble said he couldn't stick around, but that there was an untouched supply of rations a few cells down that I, as an organism that needs to eat to survive, should go and find. Even with the blindfold, it shouldn't be too hard for me to get there. I'll think about going tomorrow. Day 5. As I felt my way through the hallway to the other cell, I could tell that things had gone really off the deep end. There were people fused into the walls, no doubt because of one of the other anomalies, and I had no idea whether or not they were on my side. There was no doubt that mimetic cognito hazards were scrawled all over the surfaces of the facility as well. If the scribe had truly been on the loose, he definitely have made those brain-destroying symbols he always did. Maybe my current lack of vision was a good thing, especially because spending so much of my time blindfolded had enhanced my sense of smell. From the inside of a nearby open cell, I caught wind of a tray of day-old foundation rations. And what luck. They were the same kind usually given to humanoid anomalies like me. These must have been the ones that Bobble had mentioned. I settled into this new cell and enjoyed my first full meal in days. Day 6. With the power suppressing device still firmly on my head, getting out of here seemed like a pipe dream. I spent the day thinking about the only other person in Site 13 who was kind to me, Dr. Hadley. She was a researcher who took care of some of the humanoid anomalies. Even though she's working with the Foundation, I get the feeling that she's actually a really good person deep down. Maybe it's the Stockholm Syndrome talking, but I really wish I could see her face. She always had sympathy for Elijah, the leech boy, and saw him as an ordinary kid despite his blood-draining powers. I can only hope that both of them are safe. Day 7 I continued to make my way across the facility, hugging the wall as tightly as I could. I could hear weapon fire throughout the facility and countless anomalies battling it out. All of a sudden, I was caught off guard when I heard several footsteps coming towards me. These must have been Foundation personnel, I thought. A shot rang out, and I was hit directly in my headgear by some kind of piercing round. Fortunately, the suppression device was strong enough to take the hit for me, so I didn't take direct damage and it was equally fortunate that being shot at had caused it to malfunction. I could now remove the headgear and blindfold and stare down the group of armed Foundation guards in front of me. It's the Crusher! One of them shouted. My name is Thoreau, I responded. I didn't give them a chance to fire again, and using my ability to defend myself was the only way out. After all the anomalies I had compressed at their orders, doing the same to Emerson's forces came all too naturally. To them, we were merely objects, things to be used up before we're incinerated. Whether we're human, inhuman, or something entirely indescribable, it made no difference to Emerson and his underlings, since all of us are going to the same place. After that encounter with the guards, I decided that I wouldn't use my powers to harm my fellow anomaly. We had all endured so much in Site 13 that it felt needlessly brutal to let the one thing that I had in common with the other prisoners be a weapon against them. I couldn't guarantee that all the other anomalies would treat me the same way, but the idea of living by that principle filled me with a sense of purpose. From now on, it was me against Site 13. I would survive and escape to the outside world. Day 8. To my surprise, there was a mundane vending machine in this terrible place. I used my powers to break into it, raking in the delicious bounty of chips, protein bars, and fruit snacks. This stash would take care of my sustenance needs for a while, so I stored them in a military pack I had taken from one of the guards I had fought with the other day. Day 9, I began to realize that the rooms I was traveling through were repeating themselves. It was hard to really notice at first, with all the cognito hazards I was trying to avoid, but it seemed like Site 13 was reshuffling itself in a way that had made my progress through it completely circuitous. While this meant that my encounters with dangerous anomalies and guards had been basically non-existent, it also meant that I wasn't making any progress towards escape. Day 10 through 14. Yep, I'm officially stuck in a loop now. This was probably unavoidable, even if I had a mental map of the facility or even a physical map. Reality is so broken by the effects of the Thresher that I don't really know if the rest of Site 13 even still exists. I honestly wouldn't be that upset if Director Emerson and the rest of the Foundation personnel had been flung into oblivion. That would be worth it, even if I spent the rest of my days here wandering around and eating vending machine food. 
Day 15. I gained access to a new area of the facility, only to find that it was a stairwell filled with a terrifyingly black, gooey substance. I had no idea what this stuff was, but perhaps it was best not to touch it. Yeah, that would definitely be for the best. Still, there were stairs going away from the goo, which could lead me closer to an exit, so I decided to take that risk and sprint up to a higher level. As if waiting for a cue, the liquid began to rise as soon as I set foot in the stairwell. I climbed the stairs as fast as I could, for this stuff was determined. I thought I could slow it down by crushing some of the stairs, but using my powers caused some of the substance to splash onto my hand. It didn't hurt, freaky, but it definitely could have been worse. I made it out of the stairwell otherwise intact, and thankfully the new floor I found myself on wasn't anywhere that I'd been before. There were giant leeches everywhere, crawling through cracks in the wall. Did Elijah do this? Day 16 through 27. I continued making my way through the unexplored sections, encountering a lot of the remains of dead guards, but no fellow anomalies beside the leeches. I made a point of not getting too close to them, and they didn't seem to bother me either. Most of the leeches seemed content to drink the blood from the corpses of which there were plenty. There were fewer cognito hazards, and I was grateful for that. I managed to find and crush a few more vending machines to restock my food supplies. Compared to the rations I had been fed since I was first brought here, these snacks practically tasted like gourmet food. On day 28, Bobble found me again, or rather, I found him. He was inside of a laptop in one of the abandoned research offices. We compared notes, and it gave me some idea of what happened that caused so many of us to escape. Apparently, Dr. Hadley had stood up to Emerson and sabotaged the incinerator. I guess she truly was a good person. I'll have to thank her personally if I happen to find her still alive somewhere in all of this. It could have also been her who activated the Thresher machine, but I wouldn't put it past Emerson to do the same. Of course, he would have done so in an effort to take the rest of us with him. Isn't it remarkable that the person we think we can trust and the people who hold us prisoner might wind up taking the same action for completely different reasons? It could be that my embarrassing little crush on Dr. Hadley was stopping me from seeing the bigger picture. In any case, I thanked Bobble and pressed onward. Day 29 through 39. While the reshuffling of the hallways and rooms had considerably slowed down my exploration of Site-13, I can safely say that I'm making progress towards finding some kind of way out. I've come to realize that the further I get from the lower levels where the Thresher is at, it's most powerful, the more stable the facility's layout becomes. If I can make it to the rooftop, then I'm as good as free. So my guiding philosophy has become onwards and upwards. Day 40. Now this is unexpected. I was confronted by another group of armed Foundation personnel, different uniforms. One of the mobile task forces, I think. But instead of shooting me, they just started asking questions. The most confusing of which was, What is your object class and SCP designation number? I had no idea how to answer. Were things that different in the other containment sites? Site 13 had never given us numbers or formal classifications beyond simple nicknames derived from our anomalous properties. I wasn't sure what was going on, but I also didn't want to risk getting put back into containment. I couldn't be sure this wasn't some kind of foundation trick, or I hadn't somehow lost my mind because of some cognito hazard I'd accidentally glimpsed. I crushed a doorway using my powers and ran for it. A few shots echoed behind me, but the apparent leader of the mobile task force called for them to hold their fire. Whoever these people were, they definitely weren't with Emerson. Day 41 through 52. If the leeches, repeating staircases, and occasional hostile anomalies weren't enough, now I have to deal with these alternate Foundation personnel poking around here. It was one thing to protect myself from Site-13's dedicated guards, since they'd been responsible for holding me captive, but my conscience was telling me not to attack these new Mobile Task Force agents. Instead, I hid from them as well as I could, running to another area whenever I was discovered. I can't remember where I heard it from, but I know there's some old saying about great power and great responsibility. Point is, I didn't want to have the responsibility of having used my powers to hurt people who didn't deserve it. Still, it seemed like many of the anomalies didn't feel the same way. From what I observed during my circuitous route around the facility, 
I could tell that these mobile task force agents were suffering losses. Day 53. On day 53, I found a lone agent huddled in a fetal position against the wall of one of the containment corridors. It seemed that no other members of their squad were present, so either they had been separated in the madness of Site 13, or they were the sole survivor. Either way, I felt sympathetic, so I approached them in an effort to communicate. What I learned during this conversation absolutely blew my mind. It turned out that the Thresher activation had caused Site 13 to literally jump universes and wind up in a timeline where the Foundation and the GOC had never joined forces. In this reality, the Foundation was a comparatively benevolent organization that only sought to secure, contain, and protect anomalies. It rarely destroyed anomalous beings unless those beings posed an existential threat to other life. According to the agent I spoke to, if a humanoid anomaly like me were to be contained by this version of the organization, I'd most likely be given free room and board and three meals a day. Even if freedom was my ultimate goal, I couldn't say that life didn't tempt me. I agreed to help this Foundation agent find the rest of their team, as long as they were telling the truth. Day 54 through 67. The Mobile Task Force agent and I worked together to search the facility for other Foundation personnel. Not ones on the payroll of Site 13, I should clarify. It was nice having someone to talk to, even if they recoiled in fear when I mentioned my best friend was a clown. I guess a lot of people in this dimension have an irrational fear of clowns. By the way, my new friend said that their name was Agent Ben McDowell, and apparently Site 13 was the most dangerous site that their force had ever been deployed into. I couldn't say that I was honored, especially after all this place had put me through. But the nightmare was far from over, because on day 68, oh god, day 68, the leeches surrounded us and were out for blood. Agent McDowell had only limited ammunition, and I was still incredibly hesitant to use my powers on other anomalies. Of course, my resolve was about to be pushed to its breaking point, as an enormous mutated leech arrived at our location. It was the biggest anomaly I'd ever seen, and yet there was something uncannily familiar about it. Elijah, could it be? The Super Leech lashed out at Agent McDowell with its huge tentacles and pulled them into its terribly toothy mouth. I ran away as fast as I could. Should I have felt bad that I had left my new ally behind with a giant monstrous anomaly? Yes, I was only human after all. But self-preservation had kicked in at the time, and my mind hadn't fully accepted that I should be protecting someone dressed in the Foundation uniform over another anomaly. I'm sorry, Agent McDowell. At the very least, I won't forget your kindness. Days 69 through 84. I was on my own again, wandering through the facility as it twisted and changed, trapped in a dimension that wasn't my own, with freedom feeling even less possible now that I knew there was an entirely different foundation after me now. I never saw Elijah again, or rather the horrific thing that Elijah had become. I made a guess, grimly, that Dr. Hadley was probably gone by now. So many lives had been lost because of the cruelty of Site Director Elliot Emerson. If I found him, I would make sure that he paid for the hell he put us through. Day 85. On day 85, I did find him. There he was, screaming as he was pulled along the wheel-like face of a terrifying many-armed god. I couldn't stare too long because the wheel was covered in ruins that were cognito hazards, but I got a good enough look. The man responsible for all of this was now being tormented himself. I wouldn't have been capable of a better punishment on my own, so I left him to his fate. Day 86 through 100. It took me 15 more days of searching for staircases before I made it to the rooftop of Site 13. When I got there, a Foundation helicopter was waiting for me. And fortunately, it was the foundation of this new dimension, one that would provide me food and shelter for me like a human deserves and never subject me to experiments against my will. As I watched Site 13 get farther away from inside the helicopter, a smile crossed my face for the first time in 100 days. Now go check out I Survived 100 Days in SCP-3008, Here's What Happened, and I Survived 100 Days of SCP-001 When Day Breaks, Here's What Happened, for more crazy 100 Days challenges.